You are in a helicopter flying over the surface of a terrifying lava world. Our world. It is 4.5 billion years ago, and this is the very first eon of Earth's history. It's called the Hadean Eon. The Earth has just formed, and the entire surface is a glowing ball of fiery lava and toxic gas. You look down out of the window, and all you see is endless lava. Vents of steam and toxic fumes rush out of the planet like boiling kettles. You look up, and all you see is black space and bright stars. There is no sky yet, and no atmosphere. Thankfully, you have a magical, indestructible helicopter that can fly without an atmosphere, and you hover it a bit closer to the surface. A huge fountain of lava explodes suddenly. You clean it away with the wipers. It's a good thing this helicopter is heat-proof and lava-proof. So what is the Hadean Eon? The Hadean Eon is the first of four eons in the history of Earth. These are the biggest divisions in geologic time that divide the history of the Earth into its major stages. The Hadean is named after Hades, the Greek god of the underworld, and it feels like a suitable name for such a hellish place. You probably won't be staying very long here unless you love snorkeling in an erupting volcano. But it is pretty cool being here to witness the earliest eon of our planet. The Earth was formed 4.567 billion years ago at the same time as the rest of our solar system. It all began as a solar nebula of dust and gas, which began to gravitate together and form spherical bodies like the Sun and the planets. The Earth accreted into a large ball of molten rock. Heavy elements like iron and nickel moved towards the center of the planet, while lighter elements like gases migrated to the surface. There is no life on Earth yet. No continents, no tectonic plates, and no oceans. If you drew a map of this Hadean Earth, it would probably look something like this. Anyway, the geography was all about to change, because around four and a half billion years ago, the moon was formed. It happened when a neighboring planet called Thea collided with the Earth. Thea was obliterated, and massive amounts of debris exploded out into space as the remains of the two planets melted together. All the rocks that stayed within the pull of Earth's gravity began to orbit the planet, and for a short time, Earth probably had spectacular planetary rings like Saturn. After some time, all these rocky chunks accreted together and formed our moon. This planet-smashing theory, the giant impact hypothesis, is the most commonly accepted idea about where our moon came from. The early moon probably had its own oceans of magma, just like Earth, and if you looked up at it, you'd see it glowing bright red in the night sky. Over time, both the Earth and the Moon cooled down. Lava solidified into rock, and the Moon became the pale grey colour we know today. After about 100 million years, the Moon became tidally locked with Earth. Its orbital period, the time it takes to rotate around the Earth, and its rotational period, the time it takes to rotate around its own axis, became exactly the same. This is called synchronous rotation, and for the rest of its existence, only one face of the moon would ever be visible to the Earth. Let's be honest, even the most adventurous traveller wouldn't enjoy this part of the Hadean. It's time to skip ahead a little bit, just a quick half a billion years until the very end of the Hadean. It's four billion years from the present day, and you are walking around on a barren volcanic landscape of hills, valleys, rocks, and further in the distance, a lake of nearly dry lava. The end of the Hadean is quite a different world than the lethal lava land of the early Hadean. Life still can't survive on this planet, but you are wearing an indestructible spacesuit. It's immune to heat, poisonous gases, and solar radiation. You look up at the moon. It has cooled down and it isn't glowing red anymore, but it still looks super strange and unnaturally gigantic. It looks like it's three times as wide as normal, because in the Hadean, the moon was much closer to Earth than it is today. In our modern day, the moon is 384,400 kilometers away from us, and ever since it formed, it has been moving away from the Earth at about 3.8 centimeters per year. 
Here in the Hadean, 4 billion years ago, the moon is more than twice as close. It also doesn't have its crater pockmarked lunar surface, and it looks clean and smooth. Thinking about extreme lengths of time is difficult. Thinking about what a million years feels like, let alone a billion, is difficult. So today, when we consider the age of the Earth, measured at 4.567 billion years old, it doesn't mean anything, it feels too abstract. So how do scientists calculate this inconceivable number? And what did people throughout history think about the Earth's age? The people that tried to estimate the age of the Earth did so based on the information they had at the time. One of the earliest recorded guesses was by the Archbishop and scholar James Usher in the 17th century. Using biblical sources and ancient calendars, he placed the date of creation at 4004 BCE, making the Earth around 6000 years old. In 1778, the French naturalist Georges-Louis Leclerc used a more scientific method. He took materials like metal balls, glass and stones, heated them up, and then calculated the time it took for them to cool down. He published the age of the Earth at a very precise 74,832 years old. Privately, however, he was perplexed by the extreme lengths of time it would take for sedimentary rocks to form, and he thought the Earth could have been older than 10 million years. In 1862, Irish physicist and mathematician Lord Kelvin took his ideas further. He considered the melting temperature of rock types and how long a molten Earth would take to cool based on the Earth's diameter. His published estimate was 20 to 400 million years old. The exact age of the Earth that we accept today was measured using a technique called radiometric dating, first calculated by the American geochemist Claire Cameron Patterson in 1956. He measured the decay of isotopes, which are alternative forms of elements that can decay into smaller elements. The time it takes for half of a parent form to decay into its daughter form is called the half-life, and Patterson measured uranium-238, which decays into the stable lead-206 with a half-life of 4.47 billion years. You bend down and pick up a loose rock from the ground. It's a chunky thing about the size of a tennis ball, with rough edges and smooth faces. It's a common igneous rock called basalt and it formed when lava cooled on the Earth's surface. This basalt will probably never survive billions of years until the modern day, so we probably can't use this for dating. Instead, geologists perform radiometric dating on super old rocks that existed since the Earth formed, that were never exposed to the Earth's rock cycle. They dated meteorites and moon samples, both of which formed around the same time as the Earth, and that's what gives us our number. Just for fun, you chuck your lump of basalt into the lava. It lands with a satisfying plop and begins to sink. Today, original Hadean rocks are basically non-existent. While it's weird to think of something as robust as a rock ceasing to exist, it's worth looking at the rock cycle to understand what happens to them. Over the eons, rocks undergo a very slow cycle of formation, destruction and metamorphosis. Some rocks like basalt or granite are formed by cooling magma. These magma rocks are called igneous rocks. Over time, rocks can be weathered and eroded down into sediment by wind, water or ice. This sediment, like sand, silt or clay, can then be compacted together and cemented into the second main group of rocks, the sedimentary rocks. The third main type are the metamorphic rocks, like marble or gneiss which are created when existing rock types undergo extreme heat and pressure, and are compacted into something new. Not all rocks are destroyed by erosion or squished into marble. Some are pushed back down into the Earth's mantle, where they melt back into magma and could form new igneous rocks if the lava reaches the surface again. Then the whole process can start all over. While the Hadean surface was mostly igneous rock on account of the crazy amounts of lava, today the Earth's crust is much more diverse. Igneous rocks are still the most numerous rock by volume, and while they make up about 90% of the Earth's crust, most of them are deep underground. 
on the surface, it's the sedimentary rocks which are the most abundant and cover about 75% of all continental surface, while metamorphic rocks, about 12% of surface rocks are the least common. That being said, a handful of Hadean rocks do still exist. One of them is the Acasta Nice from Canada, about 4.02 billion years old, one of the oldest rock formations we know about. On the ground, a different kind of rock catches your eye. It's called a zircon, an ancient and almost indestructible mineral. It's a tiny red-brown crystal about the size of a seed, stuck in a granite rock. You turn it over, and its edges sparkle in the light. We can date a zircon like this because it has a core containing uranium-238 isotopes, which decay into lead with that half-life of 4.47 billion years. But this little zircon can also tell us another amazing secret about the Hadean. We know that zircons are formed in the presence of water, which means that during this hellscape of the Hadean, somewhere the Earth had water. The early Earth might have had some gaseous water around the time the Moon was formed, which came rushing out of volcanoes in a process called outgassing. But most of Earth's water that is now in the oceans, the clouds, the ice caps, and in the bodies of every living thing, arrived from space. Between about 4.1 to 3.8 billion years ago, the entire solar system was smashed by asteroids and comets. This event, which hit the Earth and Moon thousands of times, is called the Late Heavy Bombardment. We can't see these craters on Earth anymore because of the movement of tectonic plates, but most of the craters we see on the Moon are from this time. But how does this relate to water? Well, comets are made of ice and dust, and when they smashed into the Earth, they melted, leaving behind their water. Over those 300 million years, it added up, and one by one, comet by comet, they filled up the oceans all over the Earth's surface. As the oceans filled and the planet cooled, water vapor in the air condensed to form the first clouds. Other gases were also coming together in the Hadean. Gases like carbon dioxide, methane, neon, nitrogen, and ammonia were forming the first atmosphere. It was probably a strange orange, hazy color, and there wasn't any oxygen yet, but the Earth now had a shield against UV radiation to allow it to maintain a consistent temperature. As you continue your trek over the rocky landscape, you leave behind the lava lake, and you start to see water lakes. Night turns to day, kind of too quickly. Time seems to pass really weird in the Hadean. Because the planet is rotating much faster than it does today, a day is only six hours long. If you were keen to stay here for 24 hours and check the time according to your modern day watch, you'd see the sun rise and set four times in a day. But you don't want to stay here for 24 hours. Nobody would. The passage of time is confusing and disorienting, and it's time to leave this toxic, hot and deadly world. Since the early days of oceans of lava, all the building blocks for our world are being slotted into place. The lithosphere is growing more stable, with a solid crust of rocks cooling and hardening. The hydrosphere of water has been created from early oceans, where the very first organic molecules will soon form, to rain clouds in the sky. The atmosphere was still not breathable, but for the moment it was creating a stable environment. You take another look at your zircon crystal. What better souvenir to represent the Hadean than this ancient, indestructible mineral? You place it in your pocket. The next stop is the Archean Eon, a super weird and surreal alien planet where the chemistry and the colors seem all wrong. And it's here that you'll meet the very first living things squiggling about in the ocean. If you're interested in exploring the worlds of deep time, make sure to like and subscribe.